give you praise. Heavenly Father, we just come before you. Father, your word is so precious. Your word is so precious. And your word is above even your name. As precious as your name is, the many names you are called. Your word is higher, but it's in your word that we find your name. Oh, Father, as I just present this message, Father, I just ask you to put your hand on it and anoint it, Father, and, and just give us insight. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I wanted to just talk a little bit, not long tonight, about the names of God. Now, I'm going to just read through a short list of the names of God. Jehovah Elohim, strong creator. Jehovah Elon, Elion, Lord Most High. Jehovah Adonai, Lord my master. Jehovah Nisi, Lord my banner. Jehovah Rapha, Lord my healer. Jehovah Elolam, everlasting God. Jehovah El Roy, God who sees. Jehovah Sabaoth. Lord of hosts, Jehovah Rohai, Lord my shepherd, Jehovah Sikidnu, Lord our righteousness, Jehovah Shalom, the Lord our peace, Jehovah Shereb, the Lord our sword, Jehovah Elkanah, jealous God, Jehovah Ezer, the Lord my help, Jehovah Avinu, the Lord our Father, Jehovah Hashapet, the Lord our Judge, Jehovah Orai, Lord my Light, Jehovah El Gibor, Mighty God, Jehovah Emika, the Lord is with you, Jehovah El Nos, God that forgave, and Jehovah Jireh, the Lord my Provider. And that's just only a small portion of what the Word of God holds. You know, in the Bible, we see that many times the person's name is a description of his or her character, and God is no exception to that rule. David means beloved. Joshua means Yahweh. He is salvation, or the Lord is salvation. Jesus means he will save and is the English version of Yeshua and also Joshua. Esther means hidden. And Esther certainly was hiding her identity as Hadassah. When she was in captivity with her uncle Mordecai in Babylon, Hadassah means compassion. And I thought, compassion? And then it hit me. The courage that she had to walk in, to go before the king, after they fasted and prayed for three days, that took great courage for her to do that. But what was the fuel, what was fueling that courage was the compassion for her people. It was the compassion for the Jews. Likewise, the names of God in Scripture are various descriptions of his character. These names give us powerful and dynamic insight into his character. They also provide us with an assortment of truths about God that we can use to praise him. And when I say an assortment of truth, it's not to diminish because his truth is the only truth. We can pray the names of God and, yes, praise his glorious name. If you go to Psalms 47, 7. For 
For God is the king of all the earth. Sing ye praises with understanding. For God is the king of all the earth. Another place, it says the earth is the Lord's in the fullness thereof. The name of God, capital G-O-D, is all over the English Bible. There are more than 100 names for God. And the one he starts with is Elohim. Capital E, L-O-H-I-M. Supreme God, the strong one. The name even sounds mighty. The name Elohim is used 2,570 times in Scripture. Over and over, God's word reminds us of God's strength, his might. And the more we seek God, the more we come to personally know and experience his power. You know, I, I think of, you know, coming into that relationship with God. I think of it like, you know, with husband and wife. You know, when they're dating and they have a friend, that friendship, they don't know one another. Not the way they will as after they marry and they come together and over the course of the years they learn all the little details about and that learning never stops as we stay learning about God and experiencing God's power and his presence through his word we never stop learning the depth of God's love Elohim with a capital E, the God of absolute and total power. And Elohim is the Hebrew translation that we use in uh, the English Bible of God. But it's capital G-O-D, and Elohim is capital E. When you see a lowercase e, lowercase e, L-O-H-I-M, for Elohim, it's the same thing as lowercase g-o-d. And it has nothing to do with the Most High God. It has nothing to do with the Most High God. The name Elohim is the name of God as our creator. It reveals that God is the God of absolute power who has created everything. Let's go into Genesis 1, 1 and 2. It says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. The name exalts the power of God. The God of the Bible is a God of power who can do all things that he has purposed. He will do all that he has purposed in our life. <clears throat> Philippians 1.6. I love this scripture. Being confident of this very thing, which he hath begun a good work in you, will perform. Not maybe. Will perform. And will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. God's purpose in you is to perform that which he has already begun in you in Jesus Christ. You know, we face obstacles in our life, lots of obstacles. Sometimes the wall in front of us is not just a brick wall. It's an enormous wall that we can't even see over, let alone see through. Sometimes that wall is so thick there's no way we can knock it down. But let's not forget the wall of Jericho. The walls of Jericho were very thick. But God brought it down. Not man. God brought it down. Man just had to be obedient. We are not designed to live out our life by our own strength. Never were we designed to live out our life using our own strength. 
Because if we try that, if we find ourselves fitting into that pattern, it's like saying, not to worry, God, I got this one. In other words, don't bother yourself. And when that happens, you know, what, what's God going to do? Picture this. God say, oh, okay, and but totally backs away and takes his hand off. It was like, just the thought of it makes, I mean, just the thought that God would take his hand off of my life and what's going on because I wanted to do it my way. I mean, that scares the liver out of me. It really does. You know, I would not want to be in that position. Elohim created us to need his power. God created us to be his temple for him to live in. He designed us that way. The world out there is full of people. I need to find myself. I can't find myself. And they go through, they jump through more hoops trying to find, and they go through more religions trying to find themselves and find what nothing will ever, ever, ever satisfy that inner desire that we have because that inner desire is God-driven, not man-driven. It is God-driven. When we are frightened, we have God. We have Elohim. When we're suffering, we have Elohim. When we're overwhelmed, anxious, and exhausted, we have Elohim. God made himself and his supernatural power available to us. All we have to do is take his hand. If God is on our side, who can be against us? Who? God's power flows in completeness of perfection. There is nothing that's flawed about God's power. God is not limited in what he can do. Genesis 1, 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. God didn't need any help. God in the totality of who he is created mankind. Verse 28, and God blessed them and said, said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. In verse 31, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very, very good. I wonder if there's a reason why God created us last. I've often thought, not to be comical, and yet it does sound a little on the comic side, would we have been the typical human being that we are today and tried to tell God how to do everything? You know, was there a reason why he waited until the sixth day to make us? In Exodus 20, Verse 2 and 3. I am the Lord thy God, and I have brought thee out of the land, out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt and have no other gods, little g-o-d, before me. Deuteronomy 23, 5. Nevertheless, the Lord thy God would not hearken unto Balaam, but the Lord thy God turned the curse into a blessing unto thee, because the Lord thy God loved thee. Only God can turn a curse into a blessing. We do not have that kind of power. We would only make it worse. But God has that. And then Psalm 48, 14. I love this scripture. For 
for this God is our God forever and ever, and he will be our guide even unto death. Now, in the Young's literal translation, it basically said he carries us over death. There is, he leads us over death. Not through it, not under it, not up to it, but he leads us over death. And then we have the Most High God, El Elyon, the Sovereign Ruler. It means the Most High God, Elyon. It reveals that he is the Sovereign Ruler over all things, since God made all things. He therefore controls all things. Nothing and no one is greater than God is. Because of this, he rules over all things. This name of God shows that nothing can stop or overcome God and his will. And it's in our best interest if we, like Jesus, said, not my will, but thy be done. He works out all things according to his own will. He causes all things to work together to good, for good for his people. Genesis 14. Eighteen through twenty. And Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. And he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and the earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him tithes of all. He is the possessor of heaven and the earth. Hallelujah. Psalm 9-2. And I will be glad and rejoice in thee. I will sing praise to thy name, O thou most high. Psalm 47-2. For the Lord Most High is terrible. He is a great king over all the earth. Now that word terrible is translated revered. It means he is revered. And then in Daniel, there's a few scriptures in Daniel, and then we will move on to another one. In Daniel 4.17. Now Daniel is talking to the king because the king had a vision, but he wanted Daniel to tell him what the vision was and then the interpretation. And he said, This matter is by the decree of watchers and by the demand, by thy word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, giveth it to whomever he will, and setteth up over it the basest of men. Verses 24 and 25. He said, This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord the king, that they will drive thee from men, Thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make thee to eat the grass as oxen. They shall wet thee with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over thee, till thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Now, don't worry about this next one, Roberta. In verse 30, 
you know, about 12 months had passed, and the king walked in his palace. This is King um, Nebuchadnezzar. And he said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? And while the word was in his mouth, there fell a voice from heaven. And it was God's voice revealing what was to take place. And it was exactly as God spoke to Daniel. This Verse 33 said, The same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from men and did eat as oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hairs were grown like eagles and feathers and his nails like birds' claws. But there came a time that his reasoning returned to him. And now I, Nebuchadnezzar, verse 37, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways, judgment, and those that walk in pride, he is able to abase. Boy, he had to learn that the hard way. Now we're going to go to Genesis 16, 1 through 14. And this is on El Roy. E-L, capital R-O-I. El-Roy means the ever-seeing God. The phrase is the God who sees. That's the English translation of the Hebrew, El-Roy. It teaches us that he sees all and knows all. There's not a single thing that escapes him. You can never escape his gaze for a single moment. I find that so comforting. And it should bring us to conviction, if we've erred, that we can run to him and seek his face and to seek forgiveness because he is the God that sees. He's omniscient. He's all-knowing, and there's nothing he can't see of our every need. In Genesis 16, this is a story of when Sarah, who had no children, went to Abram and gave Hagar, her handmaiden, to Abraham. And, of course, because of that, she conceived and Ishmael was born. And God blessed Ishmael, gave him many, many, many people. And, of course, with the exception of Israel, we are seeing in the Middle East the result of Ishmael. Because it said in verse 12, And he will be a wild man, and his hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him. But in this, Sarah became despised, in the face of Hagar, because Hagar was expecting Abraham's child. And so Sarah became quite cruel to Hagar, was very harsh with her. And so Hagar fled. But the Lord saw her. And the angel of the Lord, in verse 7, the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness and by the fountain in the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarah's maid, whence camest thou, and whither will I go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress, Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress, and submit thyself unto her hands. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered. For multitude. You couldn't number the seed that was going to take place. And she called the name, in verse 13, she called the name of the Lord that spake unto her, Thou God seest me. Have I also here looked after him that seeth me? 
God sees us. He sees us. He sees our every need. And I'm, I, myself, am very comforted by that. Then we have El Shaddai, the God of sufficiency, the God Almighty. When you see the phrase God Almighty in the English translation, it's a translation of El Shaddai. It exalts God for his sufficiency. Another way to describe El Shaddai is the big-breasted one. And the implication is that picture of a nursing mother. That baby that is nursing is receiving everything that he needs, that he or she needs. There isn't anything lacking. Nothing is lacking in the milk. And it's the same with our God. Nothing is lacking in God's ability or his um, availability to provide all that we need for the things in life. God is able to bless and to bless beyond the asking and thinking of his people. I, can, I mean, I'm sure it's happened to you. I know it's happened to me many times. There's things that I've thought on my heart. Wow, that is awesome. That would be so nice to have. And never once brought it in prayer. Never once verbalized it. I just went on my way and... And all of a sudden, I'm finding God is blessing me with it at some point down the road. And that is just what he does. God is able to bless and bless beyond whatever we ask or think. His sufficiency to deal with every problem, task, or need is complete. Is complete. He can take a situation where there are no answers and no hope and do great and mighty things. Jeremiah 33, 3. Call unto me. Call unto me. And I will answer you. Jordan, when you were in my class, I used to call that God's phone number. You remember? That's God's phone number. He says, call unto me, and I will answer you and show you great and mighty and unsearchable things. Unsearchable. There's no way our minds could even conjure up what God has planned for us. And then in Genesis 17, 1, when Abram was 90 years old and 9, 99 years old, The Lord appeared unto Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And you may say, but that's Old Testament. How could anyone be perfect? They were under the law. The law wasn't given yet. The law wasn't given. And how was Abram counted as righteousness? His faith. He was counted righteous by God because of his faith in God. Genesis 28.3 And God Almighty bless thee and make thee fruitful and multiply thee that thou mayest be a multitude of people. And this is where Isaac is called Jacob and to give him a blessing before he leaves. 35.11, Genesis 35.11. And God said unto him, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply, a nation and a company. Of nations shall thou be, be of thee, and kings shall come of thee. And this is where God is talking to Jacob and then changing his name to Israel. And I'm only just lighting, lightly touching over these scriptures. Now the last one I want to do for the sake of time, I want to talk about the Lord. 
capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Lord. It means Yahweh or Jehovah. The eternal and unchanging God. It's important to notice between Lord, capital L, and then lowercase O-R-D, and Lord, all capital letters. They both appear in our English translation, but they are different. When you see just capital L only and the rest is lowercase, it means Adonai. Yet when you see capital L-O-R-D, all capital letters, it means Yahweh or Jehovah. And it's the most frequently used name of God in the Old Testament. His name refers to the fact that God is self-existent and that he has no beginning and no end and that he has always existed in and of himself. He's always been, always is, and always will be. God is eternal and does not change. We see that in Malachi 3.6. For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. He does not change. I, for one, am so glad he does not change. I don't know about you, but I grew up in a household that, you know, there could be a rule laid down, but then all of a sudden the rule was changed. It no longer was the same way. And there's no stability there. He eternally stays the same. He is always true to his character, his word, his promises, and his people. Revelation 22, 13. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end, the first and the last. God is always with the believer. Matthew 28, 20, the last part of it says, Lo, I am with you always. 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 He will always keep his promise to the believer. Hebrews 6, 18. He will always keep his promise. He is not a man he should lie. But by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before him. What was the two immutable things? The oath and the promise. The oath and the promise. God cannot lie. Numbers 23:19. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? And Psalm 89, 35. Once have I sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David. Even in verse 34, my covenant will I not break, nor alter the things that has gone out of my lips. This was the spoken word of God put on paper. Inspired word of God. So, it's important that when we look, as, as we as we look at problems, as we look at situations, as we look at trials and the things that are going to come our way, a hard task that we have to complete, maybe a new job situation that's come up and we've never done it before. But whatever it is, God is well able. I mean, God has provided by every name 
that is listed in the Bible, every name of God listed in the Bible, we can take and make it our own, that scripture, because it's in there for us to gird and to strengthen us, to not look at the impossibilities, but to look at every situation as an opportunity for God to shine. And when God shines big, you know what? Our faith just grows. Our faith, we just took it up a notch because we dared to believe what God's word said. And we need to do that. God will never lie. He has promised us. He's made an oath to us that he will not lie. And what he said, he will do. He said, I'll never leave you. We've got to take him at his word. We've got to take him at his word. He is Jehovah Rapha, our God, the healer. I'm not going to cover that one tonight. He's Jehovah Jireh, God, our provider. He is the almighty God. He is the sovereign God. There is nothing too big for him. Nothing too big. He is the God who sees us. He knows what you're going through. So don't ever feel like, I don't know what I'm going to do because God is waiting for us to say, Lord, guide me here. I don't know what to do. Lord, open a door if it needs to be opened or close a door if it needs to be closed. He's Jehovah Nisi. He's our banner. And his banner over us is love. He loves you and I. And he is never going to just, oh, I just don't have time. Sorry. I'm way too busy. God doesn't treat us like that. He doesn't treat us like that. The littlest prayer from a little child, if God will take the time to answer the prayer of a little child, he will answer our prayer. The thing is, we need to come to him just as that little child did, with the same amount of faith. And forget all the nonsense that we've accumulated up here that would say, oh, I don't know. Look how big and look how much money it's going to take. And look at this and look at that. And before you know it, you literally talked yourself out of what you were looking at. The faith of a small child. God loves each of you. He loves each of you. And those of you listening by live streaming tonight, if you don't know the Lord as your Savior, I would encourage you to do so. He is Jesus Christ, our Savior. He went to the cross for you. He died for every sin that you've committed and for every sin that you will commit. It's already covered, but we have to go and receive him and all of the gifts that come with that gift of salvation. So if you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I would encourage you to do so because he loves you. And he wants to be a part of your life. He wants to help you. He wants to lift you up by the strength of his right hand and carry you through whatever you're going to face in your life. Because I will tell you, you can't do it by yourself. Because he made us that way. That he wants to be the one to carry us through. So go before God. Ask him to forgive you of your sins, to be washed clean with that precious blood of Jesus. And then give him your life. Give him your heart. And then get yourself locked in with a good Bible-believing church. If you're in Las Vegas, come to Wellspring, Church of All Nations, 4870 Janelle, 89149. You will be loved on here, but if you live out of state and you're watching, Find a good Bible-believing church, one that believes, Genesis to Revelation. 
and that will teach you and disciple you. And get a Bible and start reading, reading the Gospel of John, because your life will never be the same, because you will never be alone, because El Roy is the God who sees you, and he's drawing you close to him. Yield to his drawing tonight. Yield to it. Heavenly Father, as we prepare our hearts to come before communion, Father, I just thank you and I praise you, Father, and I give you glory. Father, just as we come before the communion table, I thank you, Lord, for all of who you are. You are so awesome. You are an awesome God and you reign from heaven on high. And I thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Hi, I'm Pastor George Stover, and uh, I want to invite you to come and join with us as we build the kingdom of God at Wellspring Church of All Nations. We're located at 8140 West Lone Mountain Road. There's also an entrance off of 4870 Janelle Drive. There is nothing more important to you and I today than the Word of God. If we, if we don't learn as a people, as a nation, to return to the Bible to return to faith in Jesus Christ and him and him alone, we're, we're not going to have the country that we've had, the one that I grew up in. I want my grandchildren and uh, my children, your children and your grandchildren to live in the America I grew up in. But, you know, it's going to depend on us, the people of faith. We have to get into the word and, and just stick with it. And uh, having done all, stand. And so we're really, really uh, in wanting you to come and just be a part of who we are, what we're doing here, because it's really all about you.